In this video, I'll give you a brief introduction to ethics and the IRB. Uh, my name is Jeff Carver. I'm a professor at the University of Alabama. So let's begin by talking a little bit about research ethics, and then we'll uh, conclude with a discussion of the IRB. So as a researcher, we have a couple of things we have to think about in terms of designing ethical studies. So we need to be able to answer questions like, how am I going to determine if my study is ethical? and what factors should I consider? So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have some idea of the different things you should be thinking about to answer these questions. Um, some of the important topics that we wanna keep in mind as we go through this, the first one is beneficence, and you may or may not have heard this term, but the idea here is that I wanna maximize the benefits that I might obtain from my study and minimize the potential harmful effects that the people participating in the study could encounter. And the second important concept is justice. And by this, we want to address the issues of fairness between those who receive the benefits of research along with those who bear the burdens of the risk. So we have to balance those out as we design our study. And this is something we want to continue to think about as we go through our design process. So one of the things that factors into both of those are risks. So we have to think about different kinds of risks that might show up in studies. Um, the first kind of risk that's fairly common is physical harm. Now in a study that you might do, physical harm is probably less relevant unless you're doing some sort of a study with um, eye tracking or other type of physiological sensors. Um, but things that are more common in educational settings might be stress. So are we doing something to the students that might cause them to have stress in some way? Um, or loss of privacy and confidentiality. So are we gathering information about the students that if we were to disclose it in some way, it might harm the student's reputation or harm something else about them through their loss of privacy or confidentiality. So that could either become, by, like I said, identification of the people or by actually doing concealed observation of behavior when um, people are not expecting it or haven't provided consent to allow you to do that kind of observation. So when we think about those things uh, as we design our experimental treatments, uh, as we talked about in our research design lecture, um, we need to think about things that would affect the uh, risks and the benefits to the subject. So things like <clears throat> the nature of the treatment. So what are we asking people to do? Um, <clears throat> if we have a control group uh, and an experimental group, <clears throat> Are there things that the control group will not be able to do? Are there services? Are there educational activities that they will not be provided? Will, they have, will their ex, uh, educational experience be harmed by participating in this? Um, what about how we're going to assign groups? Are we going to um, randomly do people into groups? Are we going to make other decisions about how we assign people into groups? And are there alternatives? So if we do give a treatment group something different, are we going to eventually give the control group something along those lines so that their educational experience isn't harmed? And then depending on the extent of your study and what you're asking people to do, we may need to think about compensation. And compensation can come either financially or it can come other ways. So it could be through extra credit, through grades on a homework assignment and different things like that. And we could talk about those specifically in each of your studies. Um, so I just mentioned compensation. Another thing we have to think about is uh, deception. So with deception, that basically means that I'm going to tell the students or tell the study participants uh, that my research is about something different than what it's actually about. Um, and we have to be very careful about using deception. We can only use this if it's actually justified um, by the prospect of significant results and if we can um, convince the uh, IRB, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, or convince our fellow researchers that deception is really the only way to gather the data that we want to gather. So for example, if I'm trying to understand how people communicate about a certain topic or how much they say in group meetings, if I tell people that that's exactly what I'm trying to study, it's likely going to change my behavior. So I may need to tell them something different. But I have to be careful about not using the deception if there's a chance that the study could cause emotional distress to the participants. And if I do use deception, um, I want to explain that as early as possible during the study. And like I said, if this is something that we think might be re relevant for one of your studies, we'll want to talk a lot more about that in detail to see if that really is the most appropriate way to design your study. Okay, so given all that, one of the key things in research ethics is informed consent. 
And the idea of informed consent is that this is going to allow the participants in our study to make a, a deliberate decision about whether or not they want to participate in the research. Um, and a couple of things that are important uh, are the two terms. So it's informed and it's consent. So by those two terms, what we're saying is that the people have to know enough about what's happening that they're informed and can make a, an informed um, decision that's not forced, and then they also consent. So they actually do make a decision to participate. So both of those terms are really important. Um, and one of the concepts that we have to think about, especially when we're dealing with students, is the concept of autonomy. So if somebody does not have autonomy, they don't have the ability to consent. And so by autonomy, we have to think about um, people who may lack it. So uh, specifically within our studies, we need to deal with students. So if there's students in my class, do they really have the ability to say no to participate in my study? Um, they may feel like if they say no, that I'm going to hold it against them. I'm going to lower their grade. I'm going to grade their exam more difficult uh, than I would for other ones. So I have to think about that very carefully. Um, and I have to think about well, what, if a, what if the subjects lack it? So if, if I want to run a study on students in my classroom, I have to do something to help let them have autonomy. And if that's the situation for some of you, we can talk more about some of the strategies to do that. It can be things like running a study in somebody else's class or having a colleague or a graduate student come in and obtain the consent for you and hold it till the end of the semester so you don't know. There's, there's ways around that. There are other classes of subjects that may also uh, lack autonomy. And you'll learn about some of these when you do your IRB training, but the one that's most common for us in this setting is students in our classes. Um, another thing we have to think about when we do informed consent, um, we want to tell people enough about the study to help them make an informed decision, but we don't want to tell them too much. Uh, if we tell them too much, then they may bias the study. So the information that I withhold from the subjects, whether it's uh, for deception purposes or whether it's just to give them or to not bias the study, um, any information that I withhold, it, it has to be information that's not important for them to decide whether or not to participate. And it also has to be information I'm gonna provide them later on in a debrief, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute. Um, or if the activity's in the public place. So if I'm observing activity that's going on in a public place and there, there is no um, expectation of privacy from the people that I'm observing, then I could also potentially withhold some information in that case as well. Um, so I mentioned deception. Um, one of the things we have to think about and ask ourselves very carefully is whether it's okay to use. I kind of already talked about that before, but I want to mention it again because it's unlikely that you would use it, but it is a possible strategy. Um, and so the things that we do have to be really careful about, whether I'm withholding information or using deception, is how these affect study bias. So if I don't tell somebody some information um, or if I use deception, is it going to cause uh, any doubt in the results that I might have? Again, as we talked about threats to validity in an earlier video, these are things that you may wanna worry about. Um, so a couple of things about research ethics uh, that we wanna uh, continue on here. So if I'm gonna record information, whether that's voice recordings or images, I have to specifically get consent for doing that. Um, I also have to worry about uh, client or patient or students. As I mentioned before, uh, they, they are a, a protected population. So what happens if they wanna withdraw from the study? Uh, how are they protected? Um, if the study is part of a course and they choose not to participate, what alternatives do they have? So I, I have to be very careful that I don't punish somebody for choosing not to participate in my study. Um, there are also cases where you may dispense with informed consent. Um, and those are unique situations. And if that seems to be the case of your uh, study, we can talk more about that. But that's in cases where research doesn't reasonably cause harm. Um, and it involves things like studies of normal educational practices, um, if you're using things that are only anonymous or, or observations or factors related to uh, the job or organization that don't result in risk to subjects. It's very unlikely that you're going to have a study like this, but if you do, um, it's something you can discuss with your IRB and I'll talk about them again more here in just a minute. Um, and with all of these things, uh, it's really important to get input from others. Most of these situations, especially when you want to do something out of the ordinary, is not something you can decide on your own without input from your IRB. One, 
Um, and that's something that you're going to do promptly at the end of your study. And that's a chance where you can uh, tell the participants some initial results, gives them a chance to provide any feedback. They maybe can explain some abnormalities in your results or things you don't understand. And also it's a chance that you can fix anything that you've done. So that's if you've done any deception or if you've withheld any information, that's a chance that you can clear that up as quickly as possible. Uh, one other thing I, we want to be careful about in terms of research ethics is reporting of results. I want to be careful about how I report results. I want to be uh, complete and consistent. I don't want to cherry pick only the positive results. I have to make sure that I'm fair and honest in what I report. And also, of course, we don't want to do any sort of plagiarism um, as we go through this process. Okay, so a couple of things um, as a researcher that you're responsible to do that'll help you make uh, have good studies and also uh, have happy participants. One is just respect them. Realize that they aren't lab rats. They're they're people. They're students. So uh, whatever you would like them to be to do, if you were in their situation, try to do that to them. Um, be punctual. So if you've scheduled a time for something, show up. Respect their time. Uh, if you tell them that you're going to follow up with the results and give them some feedback, please do that. Otherwise, they won't likely to participate in future studies. Um, so that's a quick overview of, of research ethics. There's a lot more that could be said there, but hopefully that gives you a nice introduction. Um, I want to make a couple of comments about the Institutional Review Board, IRB. Um, so what an IRB does is it reviews research proposed by members of an institution, especially that research that focuses around human subjects or, or animals. In our case, that's going to be human subjects. Um, this is a group of people at your institution that'll determine whether human subjects research is present. And if it's present, they'll review many of the things that we just talked about with ethics to make sure that your study design is done in, in an ethical way that's actually gonna protect the people participating in your study. What they do is they determine, first off, whether your research has human subjects, and if it does, then they determine whether it's exempt, meaning there's no risk and it requires very little review, there's minimal risk, or there's greater than minimal risk. And the level of risk that's present in the study affects the level of review and the type of protection that's afforded to the subjects. So the process of the IRB is going to be slightly different in each of your institutions, so you should, should look it up. And if you're going to be doing this kind of study frequently, you may wanna get in touch with somebody at the IRB and kind of get to know them. Um, it's always good to have somebody you can ask questions to. But the general process is you first, you develop a research protocol. So that's gonna be your study design and your plan that we've been working through. You're gonna develop and you're gonna need all that. And then you're gonna have some sort of form that you have to fill out. Um, most, many places have that form online now where you can fill it out, but some um, require you to submit a paper form. And it's gonna have a series of questions. And uh, the first time you do one, it's gonna seem very overwhelming, but uh, as you do them more and more, you'll realize that some of the answers are fairly common across all of them. Then after the form's completed and submitted, there's an IRB review and revision cycle. So depending on the level of, of risk present in your study, your um, IRB protocol may be reviewed by one member of the IRB, or it may actually have to go before the whole institutional review board, which meets periodically. Many times that's, that's once a month. But most of the studies that you will do probably will be um, expedited, meaning that they can be reviewed by one IRB member. And the process is very similar to a conference or journal paper submission. You submit the IRB, they review it. Usually they'll come back with some questions, either something you didn't explain clearly enough or some information that was missing. Um, they'll ask you some specific things. You'll update your, your protocol, you'll submit it back, it'll be reviewed again, and hopefully it'll be approved fairly quickly. Once the protocol is approved and you're operating your study, uh, the things you have to worry about. Uh, one is if there's any sort of adverse event. So if something happens that wasn't expected or, or a subject complains or there's a problem, you need to be able to report those. Um, if you realize in the course of your work that something has changed and you want to do something different than what you propose, most IRBs have a process that you can just request an amendment or a change to the protocol without having to go through the whole process from the start. Um, most protocols will expire annually, so there's often a, a form that you have to submit every year if you want to keep your protocol open if you're not done with your study. And then when you're finished, you have to close it. So these are just uh, things that are general in the process. Each of your institutions will have some specific things that they want you to do along the way. Um, but that's why I would uh, suggest getting to know your process well. And this, again, is something we can help walk you through. Um, so with that, um, 
I'm going to finish with the overall lecture. Uh, I have at the end of this lecture a few examples if you want to kind of think through how you would solve these problems. Um, I'm going to just scroll through them here. Uh, if you want to think through any one of them, you can pause them, think through that, and if any of them um, result in some discussion, we can have that the next time that we get together. Um, so the first example here is uh, Terry changed some of the data she collected just a little bit because it was so close to supporting her hypothesis. Her advisor told her that if she obtained significant findings, her paper might be accepted at an important conference. And Terry has worked very hard in school but knows that having a paper on her record like this will help with obtaining a job. Okay. So if you want to, you can pause the video here for a minute and think about is this ethical or not? Uh, what are, if, there, if it's not ethical, what are some of the problems and how should we do it differently? Okay, second example, Deb and Tony helped their professor run a study using first year undergraduate students. They hoped the study would be seen as an important and publishable in the journal. Uh, during the study run, two of the 100 students behaved very differently from the others. So Deb and Tony figured that just because these students were so out of step with the others, they would just delete their scores because they did not seem to be representative of the rest of the student behavior. So the question for you to consider is, does this pose a problem? Is this the right way to handle that or is there another way that you would handle it? Again, you can pause the video for a minute and think about how you might answer that question. Uh, the next example, uh, Jenny was writing a paper on pair programming in classroom environments. Although she did properly cite her sources in the bibliography, most of the paragraphs in her paper were only slightly altered versions of the books or the papers that she used. Um, how do you see these actions? Is this okay or not? What would you do differently if it's not okay? Um, Next, Jack was conducting a study that he'd planned for a long time. As he was collecting data, he began to notice that the hypothesis he had going into the study was not being confirmed. However, something else that would definitely confirm another hypothesis was actually unfolding. So he just decided to change his hypothesis. Was this right? If it was, why? If not, why not? And how would you handle it differently? And that brings us to the end of the video about research ethics and IRB. Um, we'll be happy to discuss this more individually or in our group session.